Hello my dear friends, welcome to another video of Pulmonology Read Aloud, your one go stop for latest pulmonology articles, statements, guidelines read aloud to you in simplified manner. Today we are going to review the treatment of sarcoidosis as a part of our sarcoidosis playlist. This time we'll be reviewing the European Respiratory Society guidelines which were published in 2021. If you are new to my channel then please like, subscribe and share this channel with your colleagues so that it reaches maximum people who can benefit of it. Let's get started. So the guidelines that we've chosen today are the ERS guidelines, which were published in 2021. Uh, in this guideline, the clinical practice, treatment, uh, decisions, how to decide which patient to treat, what medications to start have been covered. In my last video, we have discussed about the diagnosis and the follow-up criteria of sarcoidosis patients through the ATS 2020 guidelines. I will be attaching a link for this video in the description box and you, if you haven't been through this video, I recommend that you see it first. So when we treat any patient with pulmonary sarcoidosis, there are a few implications of starting treatment. One, we want to lower the morbidity of the patient and the mortality risk. So therefore, if a patient does not have symptoms, is not having any complaints arising out of the sarcoid which was diagnosed incidentally, we may not actually go ahead and treat the patient. A patient who has a severe disease, a life-threatening disease, we would be more active, proactive in treating this patient. Two, we want to improve the patient's quality of life and this is very important in patients with neurosarcoidosis, cutaneous sarcoidosis or sarcoidosis causing excessive breathlessness and cough and fatigue. The indication will vary based on which organ system is involved. Steroids remain the first choice in treating sarcoidosis and steroids give very beneficial results and very quick results in sarcoidosis. The emphasis now is on who, when and with what to treat our sarcoidosis patients. As a doctor, you may prescribe treatment for a particular patient who has a higher risk of progression and a higher risk of mortality. But it's also important to involve your patient in deciding what kind of treatment course he would want. For PGs, students who are undergoing examination, it's important to remember that most common deaths of sarcoidosis are pulmonary and cardiac related. Also, sarcoidosis causes irreversible or life-threatening organ damage mainly to the brain, the eyes, kidneys in addition to lungs of course. And this causes significant morbidity and there is an increased risk of death from pulmonary disease because of pulmonary hypertension, because of reduction in the lung capacity as well as fibrosis. The sarcoidosis treatment guideline has laid down certain PICO questions that have been answered based on the evidence available. We'll quickly go through these questions. Number one, when you're treating any patient with pulmonary sarcoidosis, would you give him a glucocorticoid treatment or no treatment? The answer is that if your patient has pulmonary sarcoidosis, he's not been treated earlier, you know that he has a higher risk of future mortality, disability, he is breathless, he's having severe chronic cough, he has weight loss, he is symptomatic, then glucocorticoids will be given versus not giving any treatment. Visum is if your patient has asymptomatic bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy which was diagnosed on any routine examination or a health check, you may not want to treat this patient with steroids. The aim is to improve and preserve the lung capacity and the quality of life and this is a good strong recommendation out of the evidence available. Glucocorticoids clearly produce good efficacy 
and improve the symptoms of patients. They improve the chest x-ray, they cause regression, they also prevent progression of disease. But there is still no data concerning the mortality benefits and the balance of giving glucocorticoids and risking the treatment-induced comorbidities. So it's very important that we evaluate our patient, decide who needs glucocorticoid. And again, if we continue glucocorticoid, it's very important to keep reevaluating if he still needs that in the long term. Because usually, prolonged treatment is unlikely to benefit and you may have to switch cares at that point of time. The second question that arises in terms of pulmonary sarcoid is that if your patient is already on glucocorticoid treatment, should you keep him on glucocorticoid treatment and or should you add another immunosuppressive agent if the patient's not responding? The data and the evidence is very clear that if your patient has an indication for starting treatment, he continues to have continued disease despite glucocorticoids or he has side effects, then you would want to add an immunosuppressive agent. In this case, we would preferentially add methotrexate first. Most of the evidence that comes in adding second-line agent comes with methotrexate. There are other options also like azathioprine and infliximab along with mycophenolate, leflunamide and others. However, methotrexate is most time-tested. Again, the aim is to improve and preserve the lung capacity and the quality of life. Though it has very low quality of evidence, it's a conditional recommendation that we must manage the patient in this way. Whenever you are starting your patient on this management, you are giving him treatment. The moment you take off immunosuppressive therapy, the patient worsens. This is a very solid rationale to stop or limit the glucocorticoid in this patient and give him other combinations. So in that way, we can add the other substitutes because we do not want the patient to have a worsened quality of life. And in the same sense, we also want to take a shared decision with our patient and talk to him about long-term glucocorticoid versus adding other immunosuppressant agents. Another very important part of sarcoidosis is the extrapulmonary sarcoidosis or cutaneous sarcoid. When we give patient treatment for cutaneous sarcoid, a lot of time topical agents or topical uh, glucocorticoid therapy is added. Cutaneous sarcoid affects almost up to 30% patients of sarcoidosis and it may not be in the form of very florid disease. It may just come in the form of certain papules, plaques, nodules, but sometimes it also develops into ulcers, alopecia, vitiligo and other problems. So treatment of cutaneous sarcoid is mostly revolving around the cosmetic aspect of it. If there are cosmetically active lesions which are not getting controlled by local treatment, we may want to start oral steroids and that is indicated. Again, in cutaneous sarcoid because it can disfigure the patient, so therapeutic decisions have to be taken in that context and if your patient is not responding, you may wish to add other therapy. In cutaneous sarcoid, the other therapy that is usually added is HCQS or hydroxychloroquine and infliximab according to the guideline PICO question can be added compared to not adding any additional treatment. This is also a conditional recommendation, not a very strong recommendation. So you have to take it in uh, terms of what are the available drugs to you. There are a lot of um, ways in monitoring these patients, assessing response to the steroids, in the form of serial pictures, in the form of specific sarcoid related skin questionnaires, sarcoidosis assessment tool or SAT and these have to be considered whenever uh, the dermatologist is considering whether the cutaneous sarcoid has improved or increased. The third important organ system to be involved is cardiac and cardiac sarcoidosis. Again, a decision has to be taken whether only glucocorticoid treatment or with or without immunosuppressants should be given or not given. Remember, cardiac sarcoidosis is one of the major leading cause of death in sarcoidosis patients and we do not want to miss cardio, cardiac sarcoid. This may come in the form of functional abnormalities, in the form of dysarrhythmias, AV conduction delays, conduction blocks, heart block, tachyarrhythmias, ventricular and supraventricular, or even cardiomyopathy. Often heart block is a very early sign of cardiac involvement and it may be our best chance to start glucocorticoid at this point of time. 
In my previous video, I have talked about how ECG must be done in all patients of sarcoidosis and if there is a suspicion based on findings, then further evaluation for cardiac sarcoid is a must. So here again, glucocorticoids must be given. If you feel that the condition is severe enough, it should be added along with immunosuppressants. But with or without immunosuppressants, there's a very strong indication to give oral steroids for a cardiac sarcoid. And a lot of analysis have been done whether a higher dose of prednisolone would be required in a cardiac patient. But the consensus is that you may not need a very high dose, but you do need some dose. So you have to start with at least 0.5 milligram per kg per day for a cardiac sarcoid. The other organ system that is involved is neuro. So neurosarcoidosis is also a very important consideration. Here again, the question arises whether we should give immunosuppressants or no immunosuppressants. So just to be remembered that neuropsychosis is very, very clinically significant. So there is a very strong evidence that if sarcoidosis affects any portion of the nervous system, which it can in around 5 to 20% of sarcoidosis patients, we must start treatment. This involvement may be in the cranial nerves, it may be the brain involvement, in the meninges, in the peripheral nerves. And we know that neurosarcoidosis is an important cause of death, especially in younger people with sarcoid. So because of its deleterious impact on the patient's quality of life, because of the risk of facial palsy, optic neuritis, meningitis, we must treat this. And so if glucocorticoids are not effective, we must go on with addition of other second line agents like methotrexate and if adding second line agents like methotrexate, azathioprine or even MMF doesn't work, infliximab can be added. This is a conditional recommendation but what it really means is you really have to hit hard at cardiac and neurosarcoidosis patients. There are two more entities that have been talked about in this guideline and the guideline committee also included patients who talked about their own problems arising out of sarcoid. One is sarcoidosis associated fatigue. It is a very clinical significant problem for many patients and so the treatment decision whether to give immunosuppressant, neurostimulants, exercise or do nothing about it comes there. So for all patients who do have clinically significant fatigue, pulmonary rehabilitation should be offered. They may also be given inspiratory muscle strength training and other rehab. Observe them for 6 to 12 weeks and they should improve. If it's an unrelenting fatigue, even if it's unrelated to sarcoidosis, certain drugs have been talked about which include dimethylphenidate or armodafinil. These can be given for around 2 months. And then the patient's response to fatigue can be checked and then treatment may be continued accordingly. The last disease entity that's been talked about in this guideline is small fiber neuropathy. Now this causes a lot of neurological consequences for the patients and in this there have been some role of immunosuppressants, IV immunoglobulin. There is not much evidence behind this, so the committee does not offer any strict guideline or recommendation on it. But we'll be going through a quick flowchart which talks about management of small fiber neuropathy in the coming few minutes. Let's come to the drugs recommended for treating sarcoidosis. Now, first of all, we all know that oral glucocorticosteroids, prednisolone, is the most commonly used class of drugs in sarcoid, but there are other drugs like hydrocord, dexamethasone that have also been given. Now, initially, we used to follow 1 mg per kg body weight protocol, starting by almost 40 mg a day, but there have been studies that have found that a lower dose, even 20 mg a day, is as effective as a high dose in improving FVC. However, there are certain conditions in which we may want to give a higher dose. So a 20 or 40 milligram initial dose would be the starting dose. And then we taper it off and follow it with 5 milligrams a day or 10 milligrams a day to the patient for, for as long as it takes. So six months, one year based on the patient's clinical response. Now, problem here is that there are a lot of side effects related to glucocorticoids. So we do not want to continue it for a long time, especially if your patient is not responding. So while diabetes, hypertension, weight gain are known side effects, we must monitor these patients with bone mineral density, blood pressure, glucose, and other um, monitoring devices. Now, 
there is a lot of risk of cumulative toxicity and prolonging corticosteroid beyond a point may not prove very useful so there may be a role of adding second line agents coming to second line agents methotrexate is the most commonly studied and the most commonly used second line agent we all know that methotrexate is um, tolerated very well and almost two thirds of patients who are started on methotrexate will come off corticosteroids the dose is 10 to 15 mg once a week there are issues concerning pulmonary toxicity fibrosis leukopenia hepatotoxicity we do need to continue monitoring these patients especially the hemogram and the liver functions and since it's cleared by kidney we'll have to be careful in renal failure now Lefnormide is another drug which is similar to methotrexate in action, but the toxicity profile is a bit different. So it has been reported quite effective uh, as a substitute for methotrexate, sometimes also along with methotrexate. The dose is 10 or 20 mg once a day. The side effect profile is almost like methotrexate but less toxic. However, you would want to monitor the same uh, kind of monitoring as in methotrexate. Another drug that we use quite commonly and um, at least here in India, a lot of pulmonologists have got very used to using as a thioprene, starting at a dose of 50 up to 250 milligram once a day. Now this drug was initially used to prevent solid organ rejection, but it's a very good steroid sparing agent. The effectivity of this drug is usually reported up to 80%. But if you look at the literature, they say that azathioprine has more side effects as compared to methotrexate. And the major complications with azathioprine are infections and leukopenia. So that's very important to consider. There's also more GI toxicity, more LFT derangements and increased risk of not only myelodysplasia, but also malignancy. So azathioprine is being used quite a lot, but methotrexate seems to have a better side effect profile as compared to azathioprine in the long run. Another drug which is now more and more uh, being talked about is MMF or mycophenolate mofetil. Again, it started off as a transplant medication. It's being used, but it has lesser toxicity than azathioprine. According to literature, it is more easily tolerated as compared to azathioprine, but uh, to be on a personal note, I do feel patients tolerate azathioprine better. However, it started as 500 to 1500 milligram BD dosages. The doses gradually build up and it's very important to monitor the patient for infections here. So CBC monitoring is important and uh, in certain conditions such as neurosarcoidosis, it has been found to be very beneficial. Now, one drug which is missing from this list is cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide was earlier used, especially for refractory neurosarcoidosis. However, it causes a lot of bone marrow suppression. There is issue of infection. There are fertility issues. There are other side effects like hemorrhagic cystitis. So since we have a very good basket of drugs for sarcoidosis, we do not prescribe cyclophosphamide and we prescribe lesser toxic alternatives. So this is something to consider. Let's come to the reserve class of drugs now, the drugs that we give if the treatment is not getting controlled, patient is a failure of treatment or he has more advanced disease. Amongst this, all the guidelines mention about infliximab. So infliximab is an anti-TNF factor antibody and it is one of the most widely studied and used monoclonal antibody in sarcoidosis. There are large retrospective trials that have seen its effectiveness in cutaneous sarcoid, in neurologic sarcoid, in pulmonary sarcoid. And the more, uh, the most limiting factor for infliximab is infections because there is a very high risk of infections. And in a TB endemic country like India, there may be a very high risk of developing TB. So this is something that has to be taken into consideration. Another problem is a life-threatening allergic reaction because it's a monoclonal antibody. However, uh, we still are getting more and more papers and evidence on it. But whenever it is started, it is usually for very advanced diseases. And we have to screen for prior TB. We have to monitor for allergic reactions and in certain patients it may be contraindicated. Another uh, group drug, Adalimumab, 
it has lesser toxicity it is given every one to two weeks again not too much robust evidence experience is limited and there is another alternate to this as well which is called golimumab another anti tnf anti monoclonal antibody again not a part of guidelines but this may be something that may be a good molecule for future uh, research coming to um, other agents again just a mention of etanercep which is again a tnf receptor antagonist and some studies have found some effect on sarcoid with it now the next drug mentioned in the guidelines is rituximab and rituximab started again for non hodgkins lymphoma now this is considered as a third line therapy for advanced sarcoid of the lungs the eye the brain and the heart now current recommendation is that if your patient is in on advanced disease he is not responding to other treatment then rituximab can be added especially renal and other uh, neurologic sarcoidosis and then patient can be continued on rituximab maintenance regimen this drug has lower rate of drug withdrawal than the anti tnf alpha, uh, tnf agents and this uh, drug is of good use in maintenance treatment for patients but remember there's a high risk of viral reactivation and igg deficiency uh, increased risk of viral hepatitis and infections are very common now the other agent that is mentioned is repository corticotropin injection now this again is not used very commonly it has a lot of toxicity related to it so this is again a reserved drug and something which is mentioned right at the end but something that is used very frequently is hydroxychloroquine now we know of hydroxychloroquine's role in um sarcoidosis in a dose of 200 to 400 mg once a day it's been used for many many years and something that i want you to take home today is that the most common indication is cutaneous sarcoidosis to treat skin manifestations and also c for cutaneous c for calcium in patients who have calcium metabolism abnormality so uh, this is a good agent but the only problem is ocular toxicity so in place of uh, chloroquine hydroxychloroquine is a preferred molecule but you still have to monitor patient with ocular exams routinely because there may be a significant loss of vision and every 6 to 12 months patients on hcq should be monitored that's very important now we're coming to the close of our video and i'll be summarizing few very quick points to see in a patient with sarcoidosis one is that you have to look at lot of clinical outcomes so the guidelines mention that there are certain critical outcomes and certain important outcomes that you must keep measuring in your patient while on treatment now among this it is very critical to keep checking the eye for ocular manifestations for uveitis for optic neuritis you must check obviously the patient for clinical worsening kidney evaluation goes hand in hand with creatinine being done right at the screening and we keep monitoring it annually hypercalcemia very strong recommendation which i discussed in my previous video lofgren syndrome the quality of life which you can check with lot of questionnaires and the sat tool adverse events and questionnaires in patients who have cardiac sarcoid we would want to check for worsening cardiac mri is very important and preferable to pet we may however continue to monitor this patient and mri or pet may have some role in deciding about treatment duration we keep a strong check for arrhythmias and for adverse events in these patients as well we quickly briefly summarize what are the treatment guidelines for sarcoidosis in each of the important systems starting with pulmonary sarcoid firstly we evaluate if your patient does actually need treatment now if your patient does need treatment but it is a low risk case you may just want to observe him assess for need of treatment if he does does need treatment you may want to give glucocorticoid steroids which have a strong recommendation in quality of evidence If your patient has an intermediate risk but impaired quality of life say he has breathlessness he has chronic cough then glucocorticoids will be given lowest possible dose 
and if it's a good clinical response which is again a conditional recommendation we may be able to taper off the glucocorticosteroids but if your patient has significant side effects with glucocorticoids you may consider second line agents and if the patient continues to have disease you may consider the third line agents still continues to have disease then we can check with advanced therapies like rituximab, JAK inhibitor and corticotropin injections. Now if your patient had a high risk disease to start with we must definitely give glucocorticoids in the right dose. If the patient has significant effects or continued relapse again the second line agent check for clinical response and taper the glucocorticosteroids or start sec the third line agent check for response or start the reserve drug. So this is how we manage pulmonary sarcoidosis. Talking about cutaneous sarcoidosis just briefly, when we manage cutaneous sarcoidosis, we assess for the need of treatment again, and if needed, just give topical corticosteroids. If your patient does not respond, continued disease, then oral corticosteroids. Again, one drug, as I said, very important in cutaneous sarcoidosis is hydroxychloroquine. Patient response, good, doesn't response, methotrexate. Continues to response role of infliximab, adalimumab, and other agents. Amongst the other agents, epremilast and tofacitinib, they have been mentioned. But again, this is a case-to-case -case basis decision for disfiguring cutaneous sarcoidosis. And uh, this is not a practice guideline, it's just a recommendation based on the literature. There is no systematic review of this literature still. Coming to the third, cardiac sarcoid. Very important if your patient with cardiac sarcoid has a heart block, has a, um, has a persistent rhythmia, uh, he may need a pacemaker or he may need an implanted cardioverter defibrillator. This is a very strong indication and uh, with a cardiology consult, this may be important uh, and it may be life-saving for your patient. Talking about the pharmacotherapy, glucocorticoids have to be given in cardiac sarcoidosis which is clinically relevant. The decision is to whether you would need second line agents or not or whether you would need it initially and then take it off. If there's a good response, we would taper off the glucocorticosteroids and just continue with the other agents. Now, if the patient's not responding, we may want to switch to a different second line agent amongst these or uh, if your patient has been on these therapy and continuous disease, again, infliximab, adalimumab, and in this case, maybe even cyclophosphamide for life-threatening cases may be required. Now, this is basically a description of what the members of the committee generally practice. There's not uh, too much evidence here, and they haven't done a systematic review of literature for this. However, it's a good clinical practice recommendation and has to be taken in this regard. Coming to last which is small fiber neuropathy related symptoms. We did not talk about it in the initial recommendation slide. So uh, small fiber neuropathy again we need to assess the need of treatment. If your patient does not have much symptoms you just watch and do no medical therapy. Now, if your patient has severe disabling symptoms that are affecting his day-to-day -day life because of neuropathy, then patient will need a treatment of the active granulomatous inflammation. And then if the patient has persistent symptoms, he may be given GABA analogs, he may be given antidepressants for the pain. If still pain persists, then IVIG or other TNF inhibitors may be needed. And there is some role of topical therapies as well. So this is a summary of the available treatment pharmacological guidelines for major pulmonary and extrapulmonary sarcoidosis. In the next video, I'll be talking about the HRCT features in sarcoidosis as a quick reference to what all features we must be seeing and which will help us clinch a diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Remember to subscribe, push the bell icon and like this video and see you soon in another video of Pulmonology Read Aloud. Thank you and have a great day.